In this video and the next, we're going to be talking about euthanasia. In the previous video, I raised questions about whether or not death could ever be a benefit to an individual, so we'll be looking into that question, but for this particular video, I'll start off by outlining some key terms and concepts, and then I'm going to be talking mostly about an essay by James Rachels titled Active and Passive Euthanasia. Now, Rachels takes a friendly view towards euthanasia. He thinks it's a practice that is permissible, morally speaking, so in the next video, we're going to look at some criticisms of euthanasia more generally. But just to get some basic terms and concepts down, the term euthanasia just means good death or easy death, and it can be split into two major categories. There's active euthanasia, which involves the direct killing of an individual, and there's passive euthanasia, which is usually associated with letting them die. So in those cases, you simply don't step in to intervene to prevent death from occurring. We saw during the section on abortion, when talking about Thompson's essay, that she seemed to fail to make this distinction. There's a difference between directly killing an individual and simply not doing anything to prevent their death. So the difference between active and passive euthanasia is the difference between directly killing an individual and simply not stepping in to prevent them from dying. What that means is that in the active case, you might have an otherwise healthy individual who's directly being killed, Whereas in the passive case, the individual was already dying of something, whether a condition or a situation that they were in, they were already dying and you just don't step in to interfere. Now, each of these two categories can be broken down into three subcategories. Under active, we have voluntary, involuntary, and non-voluntary. Voluntary euthanasia is when a competent individual chooses this option. So a competent individual chooses to either directly kill themselves or to be killed by their physician. This is the kind of euthanasia that's legal in some places in the United States. Specifically, states that allow physician-assisted suicide will allow patients to take a lethal dose of something that has been prescribed by their physician. This is active killing because the patient is killing themselves by ingesting the prescription, but it's voluntary because this is the choice that they made as a competent individual. To better understand competence, we could go back to our section on informed consent. Now, on the other hand, active euthanasia may be administered by the physician themselves. So a physician may inject a patient with a lethal dose of something, and that is not currently legal anywhere in the United States. Uh, it is legal in other places in the world. So at the time of this video, the only type of active euthanasia that's permissible is the physician-assisted suicide case not cases where a physician is actually directly killing a patient. Involuntary active euthanasia would involve directly killing somebody against their will. So they have said very clearly that this, this is not what they want, they've chosen to continue living, but somebody kills them anyway. In most cases, this is just a case of murder, where one individual is killing another against the victim's will. So that gives us the voluntary cases where it's the patients themselves making the informed choice to opt for euthanasia, and the involuntary cases where the patient or the individual is being killed against their will. There's a third category, though, and that's non-voluntary active euthanasia. Non-voluntary direct euthanasia is when a patient or an individual is killed, but what they would have wanted is either unknown or unavailable. So in the Netherlands, for example, there's something called the Groningen Protocol, which gives criteria for when it's okay to actively euthanize an infant that's born with a condition uh, that may be associated with excruciating pain with no hope of survival. In those sorts of cases, the infant can't make a decision for themselves. So what they would want is unknown. There's no way to know what an infant would want. Because of that, it doesn't count as involuntary because it's not against their wishes. It doesn't count as voluntary because it's not what they want. So because we just don't know, active killing in those cases counts as non-voluntary. We just, we don't have a sense of what they would have wanted. But again, given that this is a direct kind of euthanasia, it involves active killing, which in the United States, it's not legal for doctors to do this kind of thing anywhere. Switching over to passive euthanasia then, this is when physicians allow patients to die. So the patients are already dying of something and physicians just don't step in to prevent that. In voluntary cases, that's where a competent patient has knowingly and willfully chosen this type of path. So signing a DNR, for example, do not resuscitate order. The idea there is 
if the patient goes into arrest, they've already signed on saying they don't want to be resuscitated. So physicians, when they step back and let the patient die, they might have been able to resuscitate the patient, but it was the patient's choice not to be resuscitated. So the physicians allow the patient to die, but it's the patient's desire, the patient's choice, that drives that decision. That's what makes it voluntary. In involuntary cases, that would be like a physician who withholds treatment from a patient that would have wanted treatment. So if a patient goes into arrest, there's no DNR that has been signed. The patient, there's clear evidence that the patient would have wanted to be resuscitated, but the physician just doesn't step in and lets the patient die. That would be a case of involuntary passive euthanasia. So it's passive because the physician isn't directly killing the patient, but it's involuntary because it goes against what the patient would have wanted. Then third, cases of non-voluntary passive euthanasia. This is where a patient is allowed to die, but we don't know what they would have wanted. This is pretty clearly what happened in the Baby Doe case, which I talked about in the last video. Remember, in that case, an infant was born with an esophageal problem, required surgery to fix it, and physicians just didn't step in. They allowed the infant to die of this problem. Now, because the patient was an infant, there's no way of knowing what the patient would have wanted. So it doesn't count as voluntary passive euthanasia because this isn't what the infant chose, but the infant didn't choose the opposite either. We just, we don't know what the infant would have wanted for themselves. And so it's non-voluntary because we just don't know what they would have chosen. So again, when it comes to the voluntary category, that's the patient's choice driving the decision. When it comes to the involuntary case, that's when physicians act contrary to the patient's decision. And the non-voluntary case is where we just don't know what the patient would have wanted or what they would have chosen. Then moving up a step, active euthanasia involves direct killing, whereas passive is just allowing a patient to die. And again, I'll reiterate that it's only one very specific kind of active euthanasia that's legal in the US right now. And that's when a patient themselves ingests a lethal prescription that's been given to them by their physician. So physicians cannot cause patient death directly. They can't kill patients in the United States. That's not what euthanasia is about in the US. That being said though, that's exactly the kind of practice that Rachel's is going to defend in his essay, Active and Passive Euthanasia. So Rachel starts off by talking about people who think active euthanasia, direct killing, is always bad, whereas passive euthanasia, letting a patient die, that's sometimes okay. Rachel's quotes the AMA on this issue, which says, the intentional termination of the life of one human being by another, which might be called mercy killing, is contrary to that for which the medical profession stands and is contrary to the policy of the American Medical Association. So the AMA is saying direct killing of a patient by a physician goes against what, it, what medicine is about. That's contrary to the purpose of medicine. Physicians are not permitted to directly kill patients. The AMA continues, however, the cessation of the employment of extraordinary means to prolong the life of the body when there is irrefutable evidence that biological death is imminent is the decision of the patient and or his immediate family. The advice and judgment of the physician should be freely available to the patient and or his immediate family. What they're saying there is, there are gonna be cases in which it's okay to withhold life support or life-saving treatment, even though withholding that treatment will lead to a patient dying. So this has to be cases where the patient is already dying of some underlying cause, and it's that underlying cause that's going to kill them, but physicians under certain circumstances are permitted by the AMA to not step in and to just let nature take its course, so to speak. To sum that up then, what the AMA is saying is direct killing is always wrong, but passive euthanasia, allowing a patient to die, is sometimes okay. Throughout the remainder of this video, I'm gonna to refer to this as the difference thesis. So the difference thesis just says there's a moral difference between killing and letting die. More specifically, people who defend the difference thesis tend to think that killing is morally wrong or more wrong than letting people die. So killing is worse than letting people die. Rachel's though is going to argue that the difference thesis is false. So Rachel's rejects the difference thesis. He's gonna to try to make the argument that there's not an important moral distinction between killing and letting die, that killing and letting die are morally on a par with one another. Or to put it differently, 
Rachel just thinks the AMA is mistaken when they say that direct killing of a patient by a physician is always wrong, whereas letting a patient die is sometimes okay. To defend this view, Rachel's gives three main arguments. And for the sake of space, for the sake of time, I'm only gonna be talking about the first and the third arguments. So Rachel's first argument goes something like this. In some cases, passive euthanasia is used to reduce suffering of patients. Premise two, active euthanasia is more effective at reducing suffering than passive euthanasia. So when passive euthanasia is justified, active euthanasia is justified even more. Or put differently, if the goal of passive euthanasia is to reduce patient suffering, then active euthanasia does a better job of that. Because rather than having an individual who is waiting around to die of natural causes, active euthanasia allows their life to be ended immediately. With this in mind, you can think back to the baby doe case. So in the baby doe case, an infant needed surgery to repair an issue with his esophagus, and the surgery just was never performed. So it took days for the infant to pass away. In other words, physicians opted to let the patient die, but it took days and days and days. Whereas if they had opted for active euthanasia, if the patient was going to die anyway, this would have accomplished the same goal, but Rachel thinks in a more humane and effective way. Because again, active euthanasia would have ended the patient's life much sooner. They wouldn't have had to have suffered for nearly as long. Because of that, Rachel's is going to try to argue that in cases where passive euthanasia is permitted, so whenever doctors are permitted to allow a patient to die, they ought to opt for active euthanasia because that accomplishes the same goal but more effectively. So if the point of not treating a patient is so that they pass away so that their suffering is ended, active euthanasia would do that better. For that reason, I think he sees active euthanasia as a kind of more compassionate option. It reduces patient suffering when patient suffering is avoidable. So in the baby doe case, suffering was prolonged for days, but that was avoidable. All the physicians had to do was opt for active euthanasia rather than passive. Of course, there's the other option of the physicians could have treated in that case, but there are gonna be cases where a patient is dying and can't be brought back. And so then the question is, should physicians wait around for death to occur naturally, or should they actually actively end the patient's life so that the patient doesn't have to suffer unnecessarily? And Rachel's just thinks active euthanasia is the preferable option here. Or at the very least, Rachel's is gonna argue that active euthanasia is permissible in whatever cases passive euthanasia is. So whenever it's okay to opt for passive euthanasia, it's also okay to opt for active. This does raise interesting questions about whether or not death can count as a benefit to an individual though. So a benefit typically involves persisting through a change. That is, I exist at one time, and then at a later time something good happens to me. That's the nature of a benefit. But I'm alive during that entire process. Similarly, a harm would be a case where I'm alive at one time, and then at a later time something bad happens to me. So again, I'm living throughout the whole process. To be harmed, I'm alive during the entire process. What actively killing a patient does though, is it eliminates the sufferer, not just the suffering. So if the physician's goal is to eliminate suffering, it doesn't necessarily follow that suffering ought to be eliminated by means of destroying the sufferer. You have the subject who is suffering and the suffering itself, and it might be part of medicine to eliminate suffering itself without actually destroying the sufferer. That might be connected to this idea that in order to be benefited, you have to survive the process. In the euthanasia case where a patient is killed, suppose a patient would live for five more days and would be suffering during that whole process. Doctors see this, they say, okay, the patient's gonna live for another five days, it's gonna be suffering the whole time, so let's just end the patient's life today. That prevents them from having to go through those five days. Is that beneficial to the patient? It's not obvious that it is because there is no patient left after they've been killed by the doctor. Putting aside questions about the afterlife, suppose that just doesn't exist. When a patient is killed, there's nobody left to be benefited. It's not the case that the patient is better off or is feeling better or is free of suffering because there just is no patient left. It's not clear that killing a patient can ever actually benefit them because benefiting 
someone means making them better off than they were at a previous time. They're not better off when they're dead because there's no them. There's nobody there to feel better or to be free of pain. So there's serious questions about whether or not actively killing an individual can ever count as a benefit for them. I won't go much further into that for now, but it's worth thinking about. Do you have to stay alive throughout the process in order to be the recipient of a benefit? And if so, then active euthanasia doesn't look like it's beneficial to the patient. They just can't be benefited since they no longer exist. But all that aside, Rachel's main point is that there are certainly cases where the AMA thinks passive euthanasia is permissible. It's acceptable to allow patients to die in some cases. All Rachel's is saying in the first argument is that in those cases, whenever it's okay to let a patient die, it might actually be preferable to opt for active euthanasia, which will eliminate their suffering much sooner than just waiting around for them to die naturally. Now remember, Rachel's point is to challenge the difference thesis. So the difference thesis says there's a moral distinction between killing and letting die. What Rachel's is saying is they're actually morally equivalent in these cases where a physician would normally be okay with letting a patient die. It might actually be morally better to kill the patient directly because that pre prevents them from having to suffer for a longer period of time. As a further challenge to the difference thesis, Rachel's gives his third argument. So remember, we're, we're only talking about the first and the third, but the third argument involves a case that goes like this. Consider a pair of cases. In the first, Smith stands to gain a large inheritance if anything should happen to his six-year-old cousin. One evening, while the child is taking his bath, Smith sneaks into the bathroom and drowns the child, and then arranges things so that it looks like an accident. In the second case, Jones also stands to gain if anything should happen to his six-year-old cousin. Like Smith, Jones sneaks in, planning to drown the child in his bath. However, just as he enters the bathroom, Jones sees the child slip and hit his head and fall face down in the water. As it is, the child drowns all by himself, accidentally, as Jones watches and just does nothing. Now, Smith killed the child, whereas Jones merely let the child die. That is the only difference between them. Did either man behave better from a moral point of view? So Rachel's asked this question, did Smith do something worse than Jones, or did they do equally bad things? And I think he thinks the reader is going to say, both Smith and Jones did something reprehensible, something horrific. If that's true, if you hear both of those stories, and you think Smith and Jones are both moral monsters, both equally bad, well, the difference thesis tells us that killing is worse than letting die, so if that were true, you would think that people would say Smith is worse because he actually killed his cousin, whereas Jones is not quite as bad because he simply let the cousin die. Rachel's point is that because people think both Smith and Jones are equally bad, that just shows that the difference thesis is false. Because again, the difference thesis would say Smith is worse than Jones, but when you hear those stories, you think both of those people are equally bad. They're both terrible people. So one involves killing, one involves letting die, and we have the same moral assessment. We think both of these are equally bad. If that's right, then Rachel just thinks there's no moral difference between killing and letting die. So in cases where letting die is permissible, then so is killing. Whereas in cases where letting die is impermissible, like in the Jones case, then killing is impermissible also, like in the Smith case. So really what Rachel is trying to do with these two examples is to argue that the difference thesis is false. It's not the case that killing is worse than letting die, because if it were, then you'd think that Smith would be worse than Jones, and as it is, the reader is going to typically think both men are equally bad. Now, how does that translate into medicine? Well, legally speaking, or in terms of the AMA's policy, there's this idea that killing is always wrong, so direct killing of the patient by the physician is morally bad, whereas letting the patient die is sometimes okay, and Rachel's is saying there's no moral distinction between those two sorts of actions. So killing and letting die, since they're both morally equivalent, if the medical profession is okay with letting some patients die, then the medical profession has just as much reason to permit direct killing of patients, at least in those particular cases. So again, whenever you have a case that the AMA says it's okay to let a patient die, Rachel's thinks 
well, because killing and letting die are morally equivalent, you should allow physicians to kill patients in those same cases. Similarly, in cases where it's impermissible to let a patient die, so go back to involuntary passive euthanasia, where a patient is allowed to die against their will. So they wanted treatment, but physicians just didn't provide it for whatever reason. That's involuntary, uh, and that's letting the patient die when they could have been saved. If that's wrong, then obviously killing the patient is going to be wrong in those cases also. In cases where a patient doesn't want to die, both letting die and killing them are equally bad. So it'd be just as bad to let a patient die when they didn't want to as killing them. There's no moral difference between killing and letting die, according to Rachel's. Just to sum up then, under euthanasia, you have two major categories. You have the active and the passive. Active is the direct killing of a patient. Passive is letting the patient die. Under each of those categories, you have three subcategories, voluntary, involuntary, non-voluntary. So voluntary is when it's the patient's choice that's driving the decision. Involuntary is when the decision goes against what the patient chooses. And non-voluntary is where we just don't know what the patient would have wanted or would have chosen. Rachel's has presented two major arguments that we've talked about on this video. One is that in cases where passive euthanasia is employed or used, that's typically going to be to alleviate patient suffering. But Rachel's argues active euthanasia in those same cases alleviates suffering more effectively. So active euthanasia is to be preferred. Now, that could be rendered false if it's the case that active euthanasia or direct killing of a patient is bad in a way that letting them die is not. So if there's a moral difference between active and passive euthanasia, the first argument might fail. That's why the third argument is important. So the third argument is the Smith-Jones case. This is where Rachel tries to show that based on the audience's reaction to these two cases, you tend to think that Smith and Jones are equally bad. That just shows that the difference thesis is false. From that, Rachel draws the conclusion, killing is not really worse than letting die. Uh, they're both morally bad in the same circumstances. So in cases where it's bad to kill someone, it's also bad to let them die. In cases where it's okay to let them die, it's okay to kill them as well. That will likely generate lots of discussion and questions, so I'm going to leave it at that for now. In the next video, we'll look at some arguments against allowing euthanasia, but this just gives you a sense of one type of argument that might support the practice. So we'll keep talking about this topic. In the meantime, here are some references if you're interested in continuing to read about these topics.